Welcome uh, everybody to our last webinar, um, national as well as international, in our long lasting series since March, before we go to a very short summer break and we'll return in September. Um, today, uh, it's my pleasure to have a coffee with Ethan Priel, a little bit more about Ethan in a second. Let's go further on in on our webinar and let's Welcome, Ethan. Hello, Ethan. So, uh, Ethan is the director of ophthalmology at uh, Moore Institute in Tel Aviv. So we we send live from from Israel. Of course, they took all the safety measures. And just as a warning, later on when we work with patients, of course, they uh, will work with um, work with mask. Uh, but now you have the, the the chance to see him in person first. So, Ethan, how are you this morning or this afternoon, but, but, so to speak? We're doing great. We just finished the uh, morning session of the clinic and getting ready for the evening session. And in between, we are dovetailing a presentation about multimodal imaging, and then we'll have a live demonstration. Looking That's forward great, to Ethan. You know, we are here for science and for practical tips and tricks, but as well, uh, we have a little bit, a little chat about coffee. and. Uh, Today um, I was into a, a, a cup of cappuccino, and uh, there's a little story as well behind that cup. I I want to show the audience the those who have been with me in past coffee breaks know that, and it says 10 years um, um, Heidelberg Philharmonic Orchestra or Rhein Neckar, which is the wide, wider area. And this is a, a non-profit amateur orchestra I'm playing in and I'm organizing in my free time. And this has been dedicated to me on the 10th anniversary. And I founded that obviously, um, I think 12 years ago, that was two years ago. And I thought today we we have um, kind of, I'm in the celebration mood after the end of the, this long tour. So I've picked uh, cappuccino in, in this mark. How about you, Ethan? What's your preferred coffee yeah. style? My uh, favorite coffee style is a short espresso. And the cup I'd like to share with you, it's not a mug, it's actually a small cup. This was made by my daughter when she was in kindergarten. And she's now about to graduate university. This is my preferred uh, espresso cup. It just holds the right amount of espresso. And thank you for having coffee with us. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, quick question. Is there any brand you prefer? Is it like Italian? We don't make want to advertise a single brand, but uh, do you have local, what coffee from what area you prefer? We have several, several local coffee who make their own blends and everything. So I stick with one for a while. We buy it, we freeze it, or we buy pre-made, but uh, it's uh -huh. been a while using the same brand for a while now. That's great. Um, as you know, um, uh, now it's time for a little introduction I want to share with the audience that we have a few things we cannot show live because it requires um, yeah, the, the right patience, etc. And in these days where everything has to be safe, etc., we didn't manage to have all patients live in front of us and not the time. And those cases are now uh, covered by Ethan first as those we can't show live. Nevertheless, please, again, I encourage you to ask your questions, whatever you wanted to ask an expert, in, in imaging and 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 feel free to ask. So, but um, for now, I'll I'll stay with you, of course, uh, until you have your presentation up. So, uh, let's have uh, Ethan's presentation live. And uh, we have a technically challenging thing this time. We never did that before. A big question. Here we are. It's all perfectly displayed already. So we are working with dealing with a real professional, I would say, and. Uh, uh, but the real thing is now the question for us as an educational authority, let's say, how to do practical demonstration. This is the first try uh, how this is going to work. We are both um, excited. And so, Ethan, but first the PowerPoint, please. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here on this international shall we say, cutting edge presentation, East, West, North and South, many friends uh, from far and near. Uh, I've been doing imaging for going on my fifth decade now. 
starting way back when it was based on film and dark rooms and all the way through the digital revolution into the scanning laser revolution into the dedicated wavelengths dynamic and geographies and then of course the quantum leap into OCT and OCT and geography the beauty is that we're doing multimodal imaging but the nuts and bolts are that we can actually choose specific imaging modalities to highlight certain findings. So I would like to take a few minutes to show individual modalities and then how we blend them all together. Finally, after this short PowerPoint, I will bring in a volunteer and we will show, shall we say, cutting edge imaging techniques, which I will mention during the PowerPoint, and we will demonstrate them later on live. And of course, as Stefan so generously offered, please ask questions. And we will take questions and requests and try to accommodate those in our live webinar. Let's go. We have five take home messages. Multimodal imaging is a conceptual platform, inviting and allowing growth as new overlapping imaging modalities come of age. Patient care, expert imaging skills, and of course, educated evaluation of images, they all make the difference. And we cannot do without it. There'll be special considerations mentioned during this COVID-19 period. We will discuss those as well. Obviously, be nice to your patients, say hello. There's a special way to seat the patient. I will demonstrate. Once the patient is seated, make sure their forehead is always in contact with the forehead assembly. Encourage blinking. When you tell a patient not to move, they automatically think, oh, not moving means don't blink. Encourage blinking. And this might be a surprise, but I've heard of many clinics experiencing reduced image quality. And upon investigation, we find out that the air conditioning or the fan is blowing directly on the patient's eyes. Make sure the air conditioning ports are not above or directly on the patient. It causes the corneas to dry out. Combined with naturally dry eyes in the older population and the tendency not to blink, that degrades image quality. These, some of these are obvious, some are not, but these are pointers during this widespread webinar I'd like to share. They might help you in your individual location. Now, a couple slides about this really challenging period of going through. The waiting room has to be extra spacing seating. Keep the spaces well ventilated with open windows. I usually work with an open window behind me all day. We have a 100% compliance policy for all the patients and family members. They must wear a mask, otherwise they can't get in here. Our staff uses gloves. We clean the imaging station, I will demonstrate where the very sensitive spots where the patients touch the table and the chair. And of course, clean your workstation while the patient is in the room and they can see you doing that. That instills confidence and makes for a better session. The second slide is, while you're wearing a mask, it dulls your voice. Speak more clearly and sometimes louder to make sure they understand you. Now, the patient's mask, as we know, can cause the camera lens to fog, especially if the room is cold, especially if they come close to the 55 degree lens. So we have found some solutions. We don't super cool our rooms, but more importantly, the 55 degree lens, we keep it next to a lamp on the table to keep it warm. That way we get, we get less condensation on the lens. And why the 55 degree? Because it's closer to the patient's eye and nose. For longer procedures during angiography, we suggest taping the top part of the mask onto the patient's cheek. It looks like this. That prevents or reduces the amount of fog that comes up onto the lens. Now, the special routine, specialized application we'd like to discuss. Of course, choosing the modality, the area of interest, the magnification, the scan angle, those are all natural, if you will. Focus is essential, but it's a different essential component than what we're used to in other cameras, and I will demonstrate. 
some of the specialized applications I would like to discuss today, high myopia and astigmatic compensation, patients with astigmas who are usually children, how do we conduct a fluorescein or an ICG for a child? The challenges of imaging during the corona epidemic, and there are other applications as well. So our first image is kind of a routine image, some changes around the macula, maybe some tortuous vessels. But if we choose a high magnification imaging modality, we can see some really magnificent changes around the vessels. We can see the tortuous vessels here and some of those extra collateral vessels not visible under normal magnification. So choosing magnification in fundus imaging as well as OCT to highlight very fine pathologies. Now, multimodal imaging is all about different wavelengths. And I'll just touch upon two or three. Comparing the imaging modalities involves detective work but we will learn to recognize the patterns and get more information. So the first non-invasive is confocal blue reflectance. It's kind of an orphan imaging modality, which I like to use a lot, both for RNFL, for epiretinal membranes, and for MACTEL. Always performed before in geography. And here the focus, since we're looking at the retinal vitreous interface, is critical. And I'll demonstrate if we're looking at a live image of an epiretinal membrane, we can make it disappear simply by changing the focus by a diopter or two. And here it comes back as we bring the focus into the retinal surface. This serves to highlight another point. The correct focus with a confocal spectralis is where we get the maximum light reflectance from the surface we're looking at. So the two take-home messages here, focus is critical to diagnosis, and the correct focus is where we get the best or most intense return on reflection. Now, blue reflectance should not be confused with autofluorescence, which is another non-invasive imaging modality. Two different areas of interest. Here in blue reflectance, we're looking at the retinal surface. And with autofluorescence, we're looking at the RPE. Let's take a second to look at the autofluorescence patterns. We have one, two, and three. The third is the black missing RPE. That's the black area. Whereas the area number two is yellow, it's in between. That's a white area. That's where the RP is distressed and suffering or sick. The gray overall uniform area is number one. That's where the RP is healthy. Now that seems very nice, but let's combine that with another imaging modality with autofluorescence. And this is where the combined imaging allows us to learn more than just by looking at one modality. The normal RPE is here on the fundus image and here on the OCT. The distressed white RPE over there is the same area of the disturbed irregular RPE seen on the OCT. And the missing area here, the denuded RPE on OCT, corresponds to the black area on autofluorescence. So simply by combining two imaging modalities, we expand our knowledge and understanding about the pathological processes going on in the RPE and the outer realm. Combining imaging modalities was never simpler than color and fluorescence. And of course, an innocent looking color photograph yields dramatic views with fluorescence. We will not look at fluorescence today because we're not doing a live angiography, but just to point out, that injecting the dye shows us things not visible on a color photograph. I will touch for a second upon ICG, which looks at the deeper layer of the coral. When we come to look for suspected PCV, we will use ICG because fluorescein does not penetrate blood or the RPE, or a hazy image like we have here on the right. ICG on the left shows both 
the choroidal vasculature and the areas of suspected interest over here above the papillary macula bundle. The masked areas seen in black here are blood or fluid-filled domes. That's very dramatic, but the way to diagnose PCV polyportal choroidal vasculopathy is by using a dynamic mode available, running a movie. These are all classic images. I'll show them for the benefit of the audience. We can see a branching vascular network here and a pulsating polyp above. Those are the hallmarks of polyportal choroidal vasculopathy. It takes about 30 to 45 seconds to generate such a movie, and you have your diagnosis. So again, not visible on color or on fluorescein, but on dynamic ICG and geography, we have instant diagnosis. Now as to our specialized imaging techniques, some of them we'll watch later on live. With OCT, high myopia and nystagmus, and enhanced depth imaging are sometimes a challenge. How do we perform an angiography with children? Art composite to create wide images. And how do we view the periphery, the extreme periphery, with only a standard 30 degree lens? So first for myopia, we apply the extra long eye, we shorten the scan length, we will even change the angle of the scan. Now some patients, high myopes with extreme astigmatism, it doesn't help. We've reached the limit of the machine. Ask them to wear their spectacles. It's perfectly okay for the patient to wear their glasses while performing an exam. All you need to do is ask them to have their glasses ride high up on the bridge of their nose, and you come right up close to the glass. You might even touch their lens gently, and you'll get an excellent image. Now, correcting for high myopes gives us a better image. Especially if we have a drop off, we want to get the fovea higher up. If we have an extreme angle because of astigmatism and a weak signal, changing the angle of the scan allows us to bring the scan higher up in the window to highlight the pathology and get a higher quality scan. Shortening the scan, changing the angle allows us to improve the quality of images on high myopes. With nystagmus, usually children, which is a whole different story, but nystagmus can be uncontrollable. The degree of the erratic movement varies, but we want to try and reduce the movement to get a decent, acceptable image. First of all, holding the patient's eyelids many times will reduce the motion. If that doesn't help, have them turn their heads sideways, we will demonstrate, and look all the way to the side, either left or right, to the null point move the camera head, then you'll get a much lesser movement to be able to image with your OCT. And of course, shorten the scan length and reduce the ART number to hasten your acquisition. Here's an example of a patient with extreme nystagmus, almost uncontrollable. We could not get an image by holding the eyelid. Almost instantaneously, the motion is reduced to the point where you can get an image, two or three seconds, that's all you need. Once you see the tears well up, let go of the eyelids, and you'll notice the minute you let go, the uncontrollable movement returns. Again, holding eyelids for nystagmus patients oftentimes reduces motion. Fluorescein for children. Reduce the dosage for the drug manufacturer's insert. We have a trick. If we do an IV, we apply a local anesthetic cream 60 minutes prior to the procedure. Make sure you put it both backs of hands and inside the elbow, four places, just in case you fit, mix the first or second time, you have an anesthetized area to try again. Now, many times we do an oral fluorescein. We dilute the fluorescein in juice, usually orange, and use a straw. This is the Emla cream, just put it on the hands as instructed. And this is a fluorescein, oral fluorescein of a child. Excellent results in the periphery as well. But there's a telltale sign. 
the lips and the inside of the tongue are fluorescent, even though she used a straw. That's the fluorescine taken orally. There's one thing I'd like to mention, especially with children as well. Placing the scan and OCT accurately at the foveal pit is very important. We can locate the site of the fovea by a hyperreflective dot, which is an artifact. It might not seem so important with most patients, but if looking for very subtle, minute subfoveal changes, placing the scan right on the money makes all the difference. And let me demonstrate. If we run a normal scan, which is a fast map, you will not see anything abnormal in this patient. Even running it again, nothing visible. But if we place the scan properly at the foveal pit, we have an outer retina missing area. Here again, this is a foveal scan, it's a normal scan, but it's not right on the money. Once you have it accurately located, you can notice the missing inner and outer segments. Many examples. If you have a suspected child with laser pointer injury, make sure to place the scan right at the foveal center. And just before we go on to our live uh, section, image evaluation, after patient care, after acquisition, learning how to evaluate the images, both for quality and for appropriate medical application. Let's look at some things, the even illumination and the focus we have to be critical about, looking at the scan quality and follow-up. With OCT and geography, I'll show a couple of examples. The layer of interest where we place our slab is essential. And I'll say it twice, OCT and OCTA, OCT and OCT, segmentation, segmentation, segmentation. Without segmentation, these scans are just about worthless. Here's a map. And the segmentation is incorrect. We get an incorrect follow-up, all because you'll notice our segmentation is incorrect. We must evaluate every single scan before we set it out. When you're doing a comparison, always look at the previous scans. I know it's a lot of work, but as imagers and as physicians responsible for the health of your patient's eyes, this is critical. And this is the correct. We have a much, much reduced elevation and almost no difference from the last. So looking at OCT and geography, there are two key points to remember. Looking at motion inside the blood vessels, at flow, and second, we're looking at structure. Where are we located, these vessels? They're located in three normal vascularized segments, superficial, deep, and the choroid. And of course, once we find vessels in the avascular zone, we don't want to find them. That's the problem. So we have to find out where we place our slab. We'll get two examples. Looking for neovascularization, which appears above the retina, it's usually the gold standard with fluorescence. But with OCTA, we can find those vessels if we know how to look for them. Placing an OCT angiography over this fluorescent angiogram does not show any abnormal vessels. No finding. But here is our scan again. Note the difference. The slab is placed at the retinal surface with no apparent new vessels. Here the slab is placed above the retina where the new vessels are, and we can see the perfect outline of the new vessels. Once you have acquired the OCT angiograms, OCTA angiograms, make sure that the slab is placed properly to pathology. Another quick example, looking deeper into the retina, we have new and tortuous vessels here and a cystic space. Looking at these vessels with OCT and geography shows us nothing, which is kind of a dramatic difference from the multicolor image. Here we're looking at the retinal inner layers. But if we move our slab a little deeper, we'll notice the same vessels we saw in the multicolor image. 
This teaches us that these new vessels, these shunt vessels crossing the RFA, are visible only in the deeper layers of the retina. Looking at one complete image, like a fluorescent angiogram, or the higher inner surface of the retina, layers of the retina will not show these vessels. So the last thing I'd like to share is how to evaluate images. Pattern recognition is a powerful tool. Small changes in our work habits can be very rewarding. For example, looking at the images black and white or white and black. Well, using white and black has drawbacks. In printing, it uses a lot of black ink. In viewing, it tends to cause missed pathologies. It's easy to change and toggle between the two options. In my opinion, in my work, the default should be black on a white background. White and black helps when you're looking for coronal thickness or try to outline pachyvessel, but normally keep it black and white. A case in point is arterial occlusions. The maps can be misleading, especially if you're using the white on black option. Here's an arterial occlusion with a thickened map. Here's a multicolor image showing the nice edematous retina following the arc pattern. Here is what most clinics use as white on black. It doesn't really stand out until you look at the black on white. And it's much more dramatic here to show the area of occlusion in swollen retina. If we look at another case, we have a scan taken out of a map a hazy media, nothing stands out until we reverse the color pattern. And I believe that the swollen, hyperreflective inner retinal layers show up much more dramatically as black and white than compared to white and black. So a small change in work habits after investigating the better approach can yield better results. So in summary to this first part, multimodal imaging offers many visual professional medical rewards stemming from impeccable patient care, expert inquisitive imaging routine, and experienced evaluation of images. All we need to do is enjoy our work with all these options, which is very easy to do. So thank you for staying tuned for this first part. I will now hand it over to Stefan to see if we have any questions, and we'll move on to our live portion of this webinar. Listen, there, are, there are already questions. Um, so we have one hand up and a, a question which starts with Shalom Ethan, and obviously is from UK. So um, um, do you have any techniques for assessing the peripheral retina by altering fixation? Uh, many UK optometrists are using OCT, but are not dilating pupils in patients with suspect and uh, retinal detachment. First of all, yeah. work in a dark room. The minute you work in a dark room, you have the pupil naturally dilated. So that's the most you can get with any imaging modality is have the dark room if you don't dilate pharmacologically. Secondly, there's a problem with OCT looking at the peripheral, peripheral because we are getting an aberration. We're looking through the edge of the cornea. That cannot be helped. So, um, the comment is as well, Ethan, that UK optometrists are allowed to dilate, but many of them don't do it. Just to make that's okay. Point. I'll yeah. say this: we get we get very few requests for doing OCT of the peripheral retina. There are very few cases for that. In that case, dilate, but again, you'll get a problem with the aberration because of the cornea. That's the problem. Problems. We have many more questions. Um, uh, one one question is, um, the, you have showed the fundus of a child with leaking peripheral vessels. Is it a normal finding? We see it a lot. In this case, it was not a normal finding. That's why we did the, the fluorescein. It was suspected of uh, vascular problems in the periphery, possibly second to veitis. That's why we did the fluorescein. That was not a normal uh, finding. Okay. Uh, then we have from the initial person asking, we have a Toda Raba. What does that mean in, in English? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got it. <laughs> so, uh, does multicolor imaging show the nevus like in FFA? I'm sorry, come again? 
does multicolor imaging show the nevus like in FFA? Can you see a nevus on multicolor as good as on fluorescent angiography? Multicolor images will show up nevi very well, especially since they have three lasers to make up the one multicolor image. Now, the primary imaging modality for fundus or choroidal nevi is the infrared imaging modality. That tends to show them up very well, especially combined with OCT. That's the primary imaging modality, even without dilation. Once you use multicolor, you have both the green and the blue lasers as well, but primarily we use the infrared imaging for outlining the nevi. Okay, I will can allow two more questions before we proceed with the live. And one of them, I think, is related to the initial one. So should we use fundus imaging for periphery instead of OCT? Because that's... Generally, sp generally speaking, yes. You know, the two cases where OCT can help on the periphery, number one, if you suspect skysis, and number two, a detached retina. Uh, you will get not high quality images, but you will show a detachment, yes or no, a skysis, yes or no. So OCT can give you information about, about the periphery. Best to use the 55 degree lens. The 30 degree lens will suffice better with the 55 degree. Generally speaking, peripheral imaging is done with fluorescein angiography or ICG angiography. Wonderful, Ethan. The last question comes obviously from a friend. Hi, I'm Avris from Indonesia. So you might know this person well. Happy to see you again. Do you have some advice for this Tacmus patient and for the Sinekia patients? I think this Tacmus, we had a, a small excursion already with opening the eyes, which reduces it. Uh, but maybe you want to comment. I'm not clear about the question again. Can you repeat that? Uh, some advice for Nystagmus patients and for the Sinekia patients. So it's because the, of the movement. Sinekia, Sinekia is a problem where we have these strands in the anterior segment who obscure the view. That is something which, which you cannot avoid except for trying to move the camera away from those strands. Nystagmus, I mentioned two tricks. Number one, holding eyelids after giving an anesthetic reduces the motion. And secondly, to turn the head all the way to the side, I will demonstrate in a second, all the way to the side and have the patient look all the way to one side, to one canthus, to the null point. That reduces the motion of the nystagmus patients in many cases. Okay. Ethan, there are a few more questions, but I'll keep them for later on uh, because okay. we want to see live now. We'll start with a seat. You know, this might seem like a normal chair to you, but we keep the chair at 90 degrees uh, to, the ca to, the, to the camera. Please. Mask on, yeah, and please have a seat. So we'll have our patient sit down. Uh, don't turn the chair. Don't turn the chair. Please return the chair and sit with your back to the seat. That's the first major tip. Turn to me, please. If we keep a fixed chair, 90 degrees, and have the patient turn towards us, the distance is maintained. We always have the distance of the patient to the camera maintained. Number two is we will discuss for a second, if you notice, as the patient sat down, the volunteer, as the patient sat down, the area they always touch is here. They always touch the front of the camera. So we have always been cleaning the chin rest, but now we must also remember to clean the front of the camera, because every patient coming in touches the front of the camera table. Of course, we clean every surface we touch at least once. Chin rest, and we always do it with the patient in the room so they can see what we do. Don't forget your fixation device. And again, always clean any area which the patient might come in contact with. Now, the second thing is, I'd like to ask the volunteer to take your glasses off. Please take your glasses off. Uh, don't put it on the table, please. In your pocket or in your hand. 
we try to minimize any surface. Don't let the patients put their keys or their cell phones on the table. Now, when we ask the patient to come forward and put the chin in the chin rest, please, you'll notice that they might be leaning a little back. So we either lower the table or we can actually raise the chair. Motorized chairs are an amazing invention. We have them in all our exam rooms. I strongly recommend having motorized chairs. You can lower and raise the patient, it takes a second. You will notice we have a protective shield. We install these early on. And the thing is, some of the patients come in and wearing these big futuristic masks and they bump into the shield, as you can see. We will discuss that in a second once we do the exam. So this is about the setup. We clean, we make sure they sit properly, we turn the chair 90 degrees. Sit back and relax for a second. Can you bring the camera around me, please? Now we'll go into setting up a live demonstration of the camera in front of the screen. The first thing I'd like to show is how we do our patient entries. When running a very busy clinic, we don't have time to put in patient entries every time. We use a barcode reader once we place the cursor at the top of the screen. We have a barcode reader, and every patient comes in with a pre printed barcode, which automatically finds the patient in our patient database. Now, if the patient is a new patient, we use what's called a modality work list. Once you hook up your spectralis to a modality work list, you get your patient's information from the centralized uh, patient database. Data entry for the patient is instantaneous and errorless. So we have our patient always look at the previous exam, always look at the previous exam, check out all previous exams, set them up for progression and set reference. Hold on a second, we're getting our camera ready here. Thank you. Now we'll move back a little bit to show you the full screen, a little closer. So once we have Bring it a little closer. Once we have our previous exam set for preferences, we will compare this exam to it. We go back and do a new exam. And here we'll see a couple of examples of how to manage the patients with a mask. So please put your chin in the chin rest and your forehead against the strap. Can you help me with this? There we go. Once I come forward, Put your forehead touching the touching. If I find that I cannot reach close enough, what I will do is change, is both a myope, change to my long eye setting. So if your patients cannot reach close enough because of a physical limitation or because of their mass protruding, go to the long eye to get a closer view of the OCT. Now, as you can see, this eye demonstrates a slanting scan. As we discussed before, with a myopic eye, there are several corrections. Please look at the blue uh, marker inside. Number one, we can shorten the scan. And then, of course, we can rotate the scan to get this horizontal. We can close a little closer. So once we have the horizontal scan, we can move it around and get the best quality because we keep it up in the window here, up in the window, looking for any changes we'd like to record. Of course, 
hitting ART, this will go to 100, you can use less, we get a much better quality scan. Let's not forget using our follow-up. Choosing previous scans, the first scan is the angled one, but we cannot get close enough to use the extra long eyes. And you can see this drop off at the corner here. The second scan we follow up, of course, was corrected for the angle and the extra long eye. One thing I'd like to point out when doing a follow up scan is the ideal behind that is even if the patient or the volunteer is not centered properly, the scan will follow. Once you get a blue line here, you may acquire the scan, even if the fundus image is not overlying accurately. Let's discuss for a second acquisition parameters, something many people overlook. When doing OCT work, I keep it on automatic brightness for the fundus image. Let me close your eyes, arrest for a second. Manual brightness for fundus imaging. I keep my movie buffer at 60 seconds. Mostly internal fixation for OCT, as we mentioned. And don't forget, when you're doing stereo pairs, keep it as persistent. Open your eyes, please. How to get the best image. As you keep your circle in the middle and your approach, you want to get the four corners to be evenly illuminated. If you were to keep it at a normal eye, you will not have a fundus image on the myopic eye. That's why once you align your fundus image, play with a scan placement on the OCT to get the OCT image in place. If you were to find an abnormal foveal outline, the way to look for any suspected changes, go to the star pattern, crank it up to maximum, but shorten it as short as possible, and run the movie of all these scans around the fovea, you will get 360 degrees coverage of the fovea for any suspected changes. Close your eyes, blink for a few times. Tell a why the same story. If we see any change in the fovea, Again, don't forget to change your focus if need be. Any changes in the fovea, go for your image. Get the brightest image. You'll notice the focus goes dark. The brightest image is where you're properly focused. Get a good four corner, even illumination, and the OCT image high up in the window. Here we only need a long eye. The extra long eye will bring it too far up and invert it. Blink a few times. Let me briefly discuss fundus imaging. We talked about how to look at, one second, let me get rid of that. There we go. How to look and deal with patients with severe nystagmus. I need help with the camera here. Please move your head, turn your head all the way to the right. Keep your chin in the chin rest and the plate and chin in the chin rest and just turn your head on the axis of the chin. And now even closer. And now look all the way to the left. Look all the way at me, all the way to the left. If I adjust my camera, I can get a good image. I can get a good image, even though the patient's head is turned. Go back here, all the way to the side while he's looking to the left. Same thing goes for the other eye. Turn all the way to the right. Keep your chin in the chin rest, chin, chin here, and look all the way at me. And again, I will move the camera. You can see his vision is all the way to the side. I will line up. He, of course, fortunately does not have nystagmus, but the idea is to get the patient to look all the way at the null point. Okay. Sit back and relax. I would like to mention the tissues, please. A way to look at the extreme periphery with a 30 degree lens. 
even with an undilated patient. The trick is to have the patient tilt their head all the way back. So to that end, we take a bunch of tissues, fold them into six, and place them on the chin rest, like so. Then we ask the patient to place their chin forward. We lower the chin rest and raise the camera. And now tilt back, tilt your head back, tilt back, and now come forward. And you can see that his head is tilted back. That way we can reach. And then, of course, external fixation. I will turn the lights off for a second to get better dilation. Because he's looking all the way up, his neck is tilted back. And look at how far up I can get. Look all the way up, please. How far up I can get with the head tilt, with a 30 degree lens. So, by a simple method of having the patient just place their chin, follow the light, place their chin at an angle, we can get at the extreme edge of the fundus. While we're here, okay, take out the chin. This come back with your chin. I was going to show a nice imaging modality we can use, which is called Art Composite. Show the control panel, please. If we go at the control panel and go for more, let me get the light on. Can you come closer? Let's find that. Can you come closer? Behind the movie, we go to composite. And we take out the internal fixation, go to external. Okay, we'll turn the lights off. Can I have the screen showing, please? Screen. Once we have the external fixation, we will press the ART button, get a small central image. Simply, we'll show in a second, by moving the camera head around, we get a nice composite image of the fundus. And I'll show in a second the technique. Let me try showing the camera here for a second. Turn this to me. I want to show the camera. See, all I do is move the camera around, cover as much real estate as possible. If I'd like to go further out, I'll say, could you move, look to the left a bit, look to the left, and I follow with the camera. Naturally, dilation here really helps. But even with dark dilation, darkroom dilation, we get a good result. Don't forget. Go to the control panel to press acquire. Otherwise, you will lose the image. Back to the screen, please. Go to a signal, single image. We can use the infrared imaging modality at high magnification and look at both the structure of the optic nerve head. Keep looking at this, please. Screen. I'm good. And we can even look at the spontaneous venous pulsation and run a movie at high magnification. Try to hold still for a second, no blinking. Okay. There's not much of a cup here, but a stereo image would give us a three-dimensional presentation of this disc. Sit back and relax. Sit back and relax. So, looking at the images acquired, what time is it? We can see here our composite image taken with a 30-degree lens, just by moving the camera head around. Or we can look at our movie at high magnification, taken to show spontaneous venous pulsation and topography of the optic nerve head. Last but not least, I would like to show the power and advantages of using what we call a scan planning tool. Let's find an old fundus image. Oh, this is not a full one. Let's just take 
an image from last visit, extract a fundus image, use this for our scan planning tool. We get a virtual scan planner. We will use OCTN geography, use high speed for this case, and use 30 degrees. Reduce the size, close a bit, reduce the size of the scan for the sake of demonstration, but go for art seven, which is the maximum. Don't forget to give a central fixation point for OCT and geography. Once we save that, we get a virtual scan. When we come to re-examine the patient. And we turn on our OCT option. You will notice in our pre recorded scans, or our, shall we say, the ones going for follow up, we have that. Hold on, left eye. Here is our virtual scan we set up earlier. Of course, using ICG, please don't come forward. Using an ICG or a fluorescent angiogram is what we usually do. But you set up as your requested scan, it will find the exact location. Not only for OCTA, you can do this for OCT as well. Now, once we arrive, for this patient, we need a long eye, as we saw before. We're ready and acquire. Now, usually we use a fluorescein or an ICG as a guide for this, so we have an area of pathology. Here we're using only the principle of a previous fundus image as the basis for placing the scan. Sit back and relax. Stefan, I hope you're collecting questions. Yeah, so many that we can discuss okay. for an hour. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll need some coffee. If we're going to stay for an hour, I'll need some coffee. No, we Let don't have show. it on our we, Oh, um, really? Okay. We, okay. Should, we should come to the two more questions maybe soon if you oh, yeah, yeah. just... I'm have. just about done. I just want to show the follow-up. And this is true for OCT as well, not only OCT and geography. You see, we have the two visits here, the fundus image, the fundus image, and the follow-up OCT and geography. The scan planning tool is really a very, very powerful tool for clinicians and imagers to use previously acquired images as the basis for future scans. Okay, that's about what I have on my list. We still have not covered EDI. We haven't covered other small topics. So I'll let you get on with the, with the questions. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ethan. There's a lot to show and of course challenging to, to, to video everything. Um, but um, we have lots of questions. And so there's a question. Um, a little bit related to the last, uh, to, to the PowerPoint, but as well to the live. Can okay. you quick confirm that it's best to use the 55 degrees lens in most of the cases and that the 30 degree in selected ones? What is your default application? What, what are we, are we doing, talking about angiography or about uh, OCT? Angiography, I assume. Unfortunately, this is not specified. I think in the multimodal world where you do everything. <laughs> Well, all we're talking fluorescein usually, all fluorescein patients who are uh, coming with any macular pathology, we use 30 degree lens. All those are coming with any retinal vascular pathology, occlusions or diabetes, we use the 55 degree lens, but we routinely switch to a 30 and 20 degree view with the 55 degree lens always switch to higher resolution when going into a smaller narrower image with a 55 degree lens 
for all diabetics, we use the 55 degree lens. We use, at the early stages, we look at the fovea for any foveal damage before about two minutes, but we bump up the resolution. We get exceptional results. Mm -hmm. All AP patients, we use 30 degree lens. Okay. Uh, another question is, it's related um, again to the nevi. Um, have you imaged conjunctival nevi in multicolor? We discussed that briefly already. We have begun implementing this protocol in our, um, st as a standard protocol in Stanford. So can you comment here? Um, we do and geographies of the anterior segment with the spectralis, usually of uh, quite, not so much nevi, but any lesions. We don't do infrared imaging on its own, only as an adjunct to angiographies, both fluorescein and ICG. And we sometimes throw in anterior segment uh, OCT with that as well, but not infrared solely for nevis of the anterior segment. We usually do angiographies of those lesions. Yeah, okay. And a quick question about, um, practical question, you recommended to clean in front of the patient. So what right. kind of wipes are you using to wipe down the device? Uh, we got from our medical device, we have some Medi wipes. It's, you know, it's guaranteed to kill 99.999 or whatever. Uh, every once in a while, every two or three patients, I take a break. And I use an even stronger uh, disinfectant and I spray down the whole chair and the door and the handles. We usually keep the door open and any surfaces around. But the whole instrument, I use these special you know, commercially available wipes that kill everything. I can tell you what it's made of. But if every, com every country has their own different, uh, it's ethanol and alcohol and chlorhexidine and hydrogen peroxide. You know, it smells nasty, let me tell you. Okay, um, another question here is, um, use a soft contact lens in high myopia imaging? Well, yeah, I mentioned glasses. Um, lenses would work as well. Lenses are much easier to apply, but most patients come into the clinic, they come without their lenses on, they come with their rarely used glasses. So I mentioned the spectacles. If they have contact lenses, use them as well, please. Yeah. Um, fantastic session, Easton. So some positive feedback. In your own opinion, do you find ART7 OCTA? Um, Come again? If, uh, if you have an ART7, so seven averages right. for, for OCTA, mm -hmm. gives you better results across the board. Yes. Uh, with, with OCTA imaging. So it's the question. Yeah, ART7 uh, is better than ART5 for OCTA. The problem is if you have poor fixation, poor image quality, you might need to drop it down to five. My compromise is to go for the high speed ART7 if the high resolution is, is harder to accomplish. That's my compromise. Uh, next questions. Um, is there are a couple of related questions to that. You brought up the the, the black and white and white on black discussion. Yeah. Uh, is there any specific condition or some particular disease where black and white would be superior to white on black or vice versa, yeah. or is it as you just laid out better? I mentioned it in the slide. Maybe it went too fast. Yeah. Generally speaking, we use black on white. It both saves on ink, and I have found that it's easier for the eye to adjust to the change between white and black. We change it in two cases, where we want to measure choroidal thickness, and when we're looking for packy vessels. Otherwise, it's standard black on white. Okay, so um, the next question would be, uh, are single frame volume scans suitable the worst case scenario? Single, single frame, you mean, frame. I guess, I guess, I guess you mean by single ART, one ART, right? Yeah, yeah I would say well, that that's what, what it Of course, means. if you're looking strictly for a volume, 
you can go for one ART because you're not looking at the quality of the individual B scans. So it's really okay to drop the ART for volume scans. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, do you recommend the use of the compose, compose option or composite option for peripheral imaging with the multicolor? Um, if maybe as well, a few words. There are a couple of wide field lenses out with the spectralis. So is, is not that era over with the panning and the peripheral thing? Is it not time for the wide field lenses? What's, well, what do you think? Yes, yeah, so the ultra wide field lens is a wonderful solution for angiographies. I don't think it works with the multicolor. The thing is that the multicolor lens, not every, I mean, the wide, ultra wide field lens, not everybody has that. And it takes a certain amount of magnet of, of dilation and skill to operate. The 55 degree lens is easily attainable. Everybody can use it and it's really handy. Once you master this technique of moving the camera around with 55 degrees, you get really magnificent composite images. There are two ways of doing it, either live art the way I showed or individual images overlapping. And then you can conduct a post-production composite creation. The ultra wide field is very nice if you have it. The wide field 55 is more than adequate and it's widely available. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a positive comment if you want uh, related to that question. I like the way you got a pen funders view with composite option. That's a tip I need to remember. So <laughs> that's, that's a, a positive comment here. So it's related to that. So let's move on. Um, yeah. So how about dilation for every patient or how, what would you recommend? Yeah. Normal days before March 15th, 2020, we dilated all of our OCT patients. And you might say, why do you do that? Because you can get adequate results without dilation. The answer is multimodal imaging. Dilation number one gives better quality. We have 20, 30% of the patients that have cataracts, poor dilation naturally, we get a better image. The thing is with dilation, we can do both autofluorescence, multicolor, and blue reflectance to add on to our understanding. Dilation adds flexibility to the imaging and overall increases quality. Okay. Um... So how effective is the OCTA on the periphery? What protocol would you recommend on OCTA for better results? Well, OCTA for the periphery, like OCT for periphery, is a technical challenge, number one. Number two, since OCTA looks at flow, and as you move out to the periphery, you have a more, shall we say, um, thin layout of blood vessels, the return on the investment of the effort is reduced. We don't use OCTA much for the periphery. If we're looking at vascular problems in the periphery, we still use but mostly fluorescein angiography. I think it's a trial and error, hit and miss to use OCTA in the periphery. Second last question, maybe. Can you advise on iris fluorescein angiography? Um, One of my favorite topics. We didn't have time for that today. Uh, next webinar, sign us up for iris angiography. Yep. Number one. The arm to iris time is much, much longer than arm to retina time, can be up to a minute. Always focus beforehand. Always frame your image fully, get the iris edge to edge, limbus to limbus in the screen and back focus before you start the angiography. Always do your fluorescein before your ICG. Fluorescein lasts about three to five minutes. Pigmentation in the iris masks the fluorescein in iris angiography usually plan for ICG and geography as well. You get better patterns of vascular abnormalities with the ICG. Number three, don't dilate. If you dilate your iris, you will get almost no information. Make sure your patients are not dilated for iris and geography. Number four, run a movie in high resolution because you don't need a high speed movie, you need a high resolution movie from which you can later on glean individual images. I feel free to contact me privately for extra tips about anterior segment and geography. Okay, lovely. Um, 
So maybe this question would be of general interest. What is the purpose of setting a reference before every imaging session? Once Excellent. there is a reference at the start, all follow-up scans are linked, they are all in chain, this takes additional time which is not needed. Excellent question. I want to make sure that everybody looks at the previous... Wait a second, are we done with our volunteer, by the way? Are we done with the live imaging session? Yes. I would like to say thank you to our volunteer and to our photographer. So uh, they will thank get back to the phone as well. Thank with you, you. For, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the reason I recommend using uh, or looking at the previous image and setting the reference is because I want to make sure that technicians look at what was done at the last session. I know that everything is linked and you can compare automatically to your last visit. By looking at the last imaging session, they can see maybe there was something which was not set as reference. Maybe we did autofluorescence. Maybe we did some infrared imaging in the periphery, which was not later on used as reference because it was solely a fundus image. Forcing the staff and myself as well to look at the last visit is educational and has medical advantages. Okay, great. It's a quarter past three. We uh, we planned a little bit more time anyway, but I think we're at the end of the session. And I predicted, as you remember in our previous talk, there will be lots of questions and inquiries. Um, and this is what happened. So I think we have to look for a, a second edition um, soon after the summer break. Um, uh, let me see if there's anything absolutely um, important we, we missed at that point. I don't think so at the moment. Uh, there are positive comments and... Um, um, okay, the question is as well with the muting, unmuting, some says if we unmute the message says we cannot unmute ourselves as host has muted us. <laughs> okay, so we try again. Uh, Dr. Chana, I unmute you now and you can try to to go live. If you can All right. now, yes, perfect, yeah. now it's working, here we are. So you, you have the, the luck of the last question. <laughs> Perfect. That's very kind of you. Once again, I have been on this before, so I'm an optometrist in London. Um, and I think we have to wait for you to unmute us and then we can unmute ourselves. Okay. I think that's I how it, it works. Um, but I wanted to say, obviously, the setting, this was a brilliant session, by the way, brilliant session. Um, but obviously, the setting in which you do your imaging is in a kind of hospital setting, an imaging center of some kind. Where do you work? It's an imaging, it's a standalone imaging center dedicated to imaging all manner all color all shape you name it we got it it's not because a obviously as as an optometrist in in practice in the uk that's not the kind of thing we would generally go in depth with the way you do okay. um so perhaps that's something um uh, we could actually think into here into having some sort of imaging centers made up and set up i don't know if they exist here would be an uh, interesting thing I, to find out I, I think it's well in the UK from my experience there are of course imaging centers in the hospitals in the hospitals ex excellent work and they they get you know for me it's detective work and it's yes. being inquisitive and you get when you get a multimodal imaging device you can turn on the different wavelengths and really get a lot of information there uh, I don't know about standalone imaging centers they are hospital based mm -hmm. uh, I know some private clinics must have dedicated imaging people who, who take imaging to the next level. But uh, the question about looking at the periphery with OCT coming from optometry, I think that's that's going a little far. That's more research than clinical. Uh, I think if you have a question about particular imaging, you'll find somebody to answer the question in many places in the UK. Lovely, thank you very much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you, now it works. So, um, <laughs> I, I un, you are unmuted again. Okay, you did it yourself. I, found, um, and I, I blocked off the whole the next six hours for question and answers. So if you want to go, I'm, I'm good. No, for that. no, no. We we can allow one more. I tried Dr. Lumpy again. He's not muted from my end, so okay. <laughs> it's it's on him to unmute uh, himself if he can. 
Hello. Hello. It's working. So next Hello. question. Then. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for a very informative talk and it's been very enriching. Um, I think an idea of uh, specialized imaging centers like yours in the UK would be a good one so that um, uh, we can get the details um, imaging and uh, for better diagnosis. Uh, that was my question about the dilation of patients. We don't dilate routinely unless it's uh, absolutely necessary um, in uh, high street practice. Uh, but I think that uh, to get better imaging and better um, access to the funders, uh, a dilation would be recommended. To, so I, I go with your, your answer there. Yeah. Okay. The question is what imaging modality? If you're doing only infrared and OCT and you have access to a dark room, 60, 70, 80% of your patients, you'll get excellent results. Let me tell you, I've been working for the last four months with an open window, summer, bright sunlight, no dilation, the room lights are off, I get very good results. There okay. are about 20 to 25% reduction in quality as compared to dilation. But if you're not using autofluorescence or multicolor or blue reflectance, you don't need dilation if you have a dark room. That's okay. been my experience. If you want to do far periphery with infrared, I guess dilation would help, but it would not be critical. Okay, that, that's my answer. If you need Thank dilation, you. autofluorescence, multicolor, blue reflectance, you must have dilation. And of course, on geography. Only for infrared and infrared-based OCT, no dilation, dark room would be more than enough for the vast majority of the patients. That's very good. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So um, that was that was it for today. I I have to say I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, there are very few questions we could not answer. We'll forward them to Ethan and then come back to you with his answer. And of course, we can promise that probably do another active session um, after after the summer break in order to to continue that. So it was a first try with the video and everything. We have a look on how it worked and uh, I think from my end it was all clearly visible. Time went over too fast as expected but I thank everyone out there. I thank you to to you Ethan for, for your time and to uh, your help us in the background. Thank and you very much for putting this together. It was my pleasure and uh, enjoy your summer break. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.